Well, good morning, church. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. We are planning a deacon ordination service Sunday, January 22nd at 6 p.m. for Kyle Martin. I hope you'll make plans to be here for this very special service. Our quarterly business meeting has been rescheduled for Sunday, February 5th at 6 p.m. due to several scheduling conflicts. Nursery child care will be available. Hey ladies, mark your calendars for February 24th and 25th for our True Conference. Use code FBC Joplin to get a special member price of only $39. Senior adults, our next monthly lunch will be January the 19th at 11.30. It will be a potluck of chili, veggie plates, and your best homemade cookies. Our program that day will be Bruce Anderson sharing about God's faithfulness and his miraculous healing. See you there. Be sure to join us for our Beautiful Feet mission trip January 27th through the 29th. Visit firstjoplin.org slash beautifulfeet for more information or to sign up. Hey, good morning, First Baptist. How are you? All right. I want to welcome you to First Baptist, which recently was voted awesomest church in Joplin by some of our members. (laughs) Amen. 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 So glad each one of you are here. If you are one of our first-time guests, you'll find this card, or you should be able to find this card in the seat back in front of you. 
Um, we would love to be able to connect with you, but we want to be able to do it on your terms. Uh, you can either fill this out, hand it to me or one of our greeters on your way out, or you can scan the QR code down here, um, and it'll take you right to our online connect card where you can do all that digitally, and it goes all the way up into the cloud and then back down to us. Kind of like rain, but a little different. Anyway, so glad each one of you are here. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 this morning. Um, we're continuing our Strong and Courageous series, looking at the life of Joshua. Before we pray, I want to remind you that this is during our worship service at any time. Uh, during our songs, you can uh, come and drop off your offering if you wish to give. Uh, there are some plates along the front. There's a black box back by the entrance of the worship center. Or as always, you can give online or uh, by mail. You've heard the announcement about the Beautiful Feet mission trip. And you've heard me stand on the stage and say many times it's life-changing. And, and I really mean that. And I, I hope you know that that's not pastor hyperbole when I say that. Being taken out of our, 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 our influence, our comfort place, our comfort zone, and being set down in a place that we're not familiar with, uh, serving the Lord is, is really a powerful thing. And it is a very short mission trip. We leave on a Friday morning at 8. From the church, we return Sunday evening, and it is probably the most impactful weekend uh, you, could, you could probably have. Um, as soon as we land there, we hit the ground running. Uh, I just really want to encourage you, as we're drawing down, really getting close, I really want to encourage you to continue to pray, listen to that voice, and see if God is telling you, hey, I want you to go. I believe there's some that God is still calling out to this mission trip. So I would want, want you to just consider that this morning as we worship and as we listen. Say, God, am I, am I hearing you? Am I saying yes? And if you are not called to go, would you please commit to pray uh, for that mission team, for the work that's going on there? Everybody has an opportunity to be a part of this awesome, awesome work. Again, so glad you are here this morning. I'm going to ask you if you would join me as we pray together to begin our service Father, we're reminded this morning that you were calling your people to a good land. Father, you were calling them to a place of some of your richest blessings. And Father, we get to see the challenge that came in the hearts of some. We get to see this morning that there were some who believed and were ready to take it. And there were some who turned and rebelled. And Father, this morning I pray that we would be convinced in our own hearts that your plans are good for us. And you alone are the one who's able to define that. Father, I pray that we would be mindful as the Israelites brought back clusters of grapes from the promised land. I pray we would be able to not just look forward with anticipation, but we'd be able to pause this, this morning and say, God, you've been so good to us. That we'd reflect, Father, on how you've blessed us, the things you've given on, Father, the things you've taken away. Father, we're not worthy of any of it, but it is because of your goodness and who you are that you provide these things. This morning, we dedicate this time to you. We give you praise that is worthy of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter 1 says, In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through the testing by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with inexplainable joy and filled with glory by obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your souls. That's the Jesus we're here to worship. We don't see him, but we know he's there. We know he gives us hope. It's our living hope. He's the one who is worthy of all honor, all praise that we have this morning, regardless of the various trials that we're coming from, walking in right now, coming out of, getting ready to walk through. He is still worthy of all our praise, all of our joy. So church, let's worship him together. Christ is my firm foundation 
the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't.
the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of recognize you as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the author, finisher of our faith, God. We give you all praise and glory in this place today. God, speak to us through your word. God, I pray that no one would leave here not having been changed by what your word has to say to us this morning. God, if there's someone who needs to be drawn into a relationship, God, with you for the first time, God, I pray that you would use today to draw them Draw them closer, closer to you. Reveal yourself to them in a way they've never known before. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Strong and courageous, a faithful voice, Numbers chapter 13 and 14. We won't read the entirety of those two chapters, um, but we will look at some of the, the main parts of the story of Israel's failure at Kadesh Barnea. I will warn you, this is one of the moments that would represent the armpit of Israel's history. This is not good stuff. This is definitely um, an object lesson and not an example of faith. Before we get into our text this morning, I want to just kind of catch you up just briefly. We started this series on Joshua, looking at being strong and courageous. Whatever came Joshua's way, it seems as though he handled it with incredible faith and faithfulness. And you and I stand at the threshold to be the first steps of a new year. We don't have any idea what's going to happen. We have no idea how this year is going to play out. And if we don't know how this year is going to play out, we need to realize that it's imperative that right now, today, before tomorrow ever comes, we are prepared to embrace whatever comes faithfully with the Lord. So this, this, this lesson, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this character study over the life of Joshua, I think is a very fitting one. We saw last week that he was willing to be down in the valley while others were up on more visible places. He was willing to play the part. He was willing to be bold and courageous. He was willing to be a warrior. We learned about his humility and his obedience. There are a couple of verses I want you, you may just jot them down, a couple chapters you may want to read this afternoon or through this week to give us a little bit more insight into the life of Joshua. I just briefly want to touch on these. In Exodus chapter 32, we learned something about uh, about Joshua. I didn't preach on it, but in Exodus chapter 32, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the tablets of commandments. And while he's up there, the Israelites down at the base of the mountain think he's dead. He's been gone for so long. They've seen the smoke and, and everything from the top of the mountain, and they assume that Moses is dead. 
So they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, and ask him to make a golden calf for them. And he does, and they begin to worship it. And they begin to to ascribe all that God had done to that golden calf. It is idolatry in its most disgusting form. And when Moses is coming down from the mountain, God has told him what's taken place at the base of the mountain. He speaks with Joshua. And something we learn in Exodus chapter 32 is that while all of God's people were down at the base of the mountain in idolatry and debauchery, Joshua was separated from them. Joshua was not engaged in the same sinful activity, but was separated. He was away from the sinful activity. That's what we learn in Exodus chapter 32. And in Exodus chapter 33, God has just dealt with the people. And the Bible tells us in chapter 33, verse 7, it says that the tabernacle of meeting is where people went to meet with God. This was the tabernacle where God's glory would shine where, where he would interact with Moses. This is where prayers were made, where worship happened. And in, in, in chapter 33, verse 7, that's where people went to meet with the Lord. And in chapter 33, verse 11, the Bible tells us that Joshua would not leave the tent of meeting. That gives us some indication that Joshua was a worshiper, that Joshua loved the face of God. So we have him as a faithful, courageous, and bold warrior in the beginning, willing to be down in the valley. And then we see him as separated from the sinful lives of the culture around him, not immersed in it, but separated from it, living a life of holiness. And then we see him as a lover and a worshiper of God. And this morning we see him as a faithful voice, one of two in a minority that was not afraid to trust God. Follow me if you would as we read. The Scriptures will be up on the screen, starting in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, men to spy, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. Look at verse 17. Moses has chosen the twelve, and it says, He sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And said to them, go up to the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad and whether the cities they dwell in are camps or strongholds and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time of the season was for the first ripe grapes. Verse 25. At the end of the forty days, the spies had returned, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land that you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large, and besides... We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country, the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Chapter 14, then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we have died in the land of Egypt or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. 
and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And the Lord delights in us. He'll bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said, You are right, men. I cannot believe our faithlessness. Let us listen to your songs of faith. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. God saved their life. said this, but I want to say it again. This morning, this is an object lesson, not an example. This morning, this story from several thousands of years is not for us to be able to say, oh, that was just the Israelites. In Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, this story, this story is pulled out of the pages of the Old Testament, is set into a New Testament context, and is used as a warning for believers today to not live lives of unbelief. This story, though it has its roots in the Old Testament, still has its fruit in the New Testament. This is a story that is not just thousands of years old. This is a story that must be addressed in the life as we study Joshua, but also in our own personal life. Because listen, we're going to be confronted with two choices this morning. Not three, not nine, not twenty-two. There are only going to be two options for us in light of the story, and I hope that we fall on the right side of those two options. I hope you and I choose as individuals and as a church to be the people who land on the right side. Number one this morning, The sending of the spies. I want you to see what God does. You wouldn't be surprised when we read this because you probably will have found this also in your own life. Look at chapter 13. Look at at verse 1 and 2 with me for a minute. Notice what God does here. When He speaks to Moses and tells him to call out the spies, listen to what God does. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. Right there, before the spies are ever chosen, before the land is ever surveyed, before the giants are ever seen, before the fortified walls are ever, before the cries of the faithless Israelites, before the bad report of God's, of ten of those twelve spies ever comes back, God says, I'm giving the land to my people. I'm giving this to them. When God speaks to Moses, oh, how great that is for the leader to hear. How great that must have been for Moses to be able to hear. You know what? God is reminding me that he has already given this land to us. This land is ours because of his promise and his faithfulness. Man, what a great thing. And yet, even though God tells Moses that, no doubt God's people had already heard that. We saw how the story ended. Those spies are sent out. It was God's plan. God is bringing them to a place of testing. This is important. Some of you may have heard me say this before. There is a difference between a test and a temptation. They may feel the same. They may seem the same when we're in the middle of it. And so truth be told, one situation, one scenario could be both a test and a temptation. But here's the truth. God never tempts. That's what the New Testament tells us. That's what James tells us, that God does not tempt His people. You know why? The purpose of a temptation is to get us to fall. God tests His people. Isn't it interesting that an omniscient God would test us? The one who knows all things and every possible outcome of every possible scenario that could ever be. Isn't that incredible that He tests us? If I believe that God is omniscient and truly knows all things, then I have to also believe that that test is not for God to learn something about me. 
Now, that test isn't so God will say, well, I don't know if he's going to pass or not. Let's see. That test isn't to improve God's knowledge of me. He already knows the test is for me. The test is entirely for me. That God doesn't love me more or less based off of my test results. God loves me the way it is, but the test is for me. It's never for me to fall. The purpose of a test is for me to grow. The enemy tempts us, tempts us away. God tests us too. Remember that. The temptation is to tempt us away from God's best. The test is to bring us to God's best. You and I might be in a situation where we say, God, is this a test or a temptation? The answer would be yes. How do we determine whether it is or not? Listen, one scenario is used by both ways. Didn't Spurgeon say, oh, how valuable our soul must be that both heaven and hell wage war for it? Man, that one scenario, listen, in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your test, be faithful. When you walk through that test and you look back and saw that you were faithful and clung to the one true God, you can say, God, it was a test. Thank you that I passed. Thank you, God, that you grew me and matured me and brought me to your best through the middle of that test. You go through it and you yield to that temptation and you fall. You turn back to the Lord. You say, thank you that I have forgiveness in you. Thank you, God, that you restore me. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that you do not love me less because I failed. Amen? The test and the temptation We saw the spies are sent out. God is bringing His people to a test so that they would learn. And then number two, we see the reports of the spies. Numbers chapter 13, verse 28, you see the report. And all twelve will agree. The land is good. All of our enemies are there. There are giants in the land. There are fortified cities. Are all of those things true? Yes. Joshua would not refute that. Caleb would not refute that. All of their enemies were there. That's a fact. The cities are tall and fortified. That's a fact. There are giants in the land. They did seem like grasshoppers to them. That's a fact. All of those things are true. They would all come back in agreement, 100%. These things are true. These are the facts of what we saw. The difference comes with how the spies, the perspective that the spies used. Even though they were all working off of the same information regarding the facts on the ground of the land, the difference comes through the perspective of the spies. The ten come back and say, we can't do it. The enemies are too strong. They're giants. The city walls are too high and too fortified. We'd never be able to get into them. But the other two, Caleb and Joshua, where the ten were looking from the perspective of man, two were looking from the perspective of God. Ten were saying the giants are great. Two were saying they're not greater than God. Ten were saying there's no way we can do it. There's two that were saying there's no way God can't do it. This could not be more night and day difference. This could not be any more different. You know what I find amazing? You don't see it when you just read through Numbers chapter 13. But when God called Moses to send those spies, please get this. When God called Moses to send those spies to the Negev, and they end up on Mount Hebron, centuries before that, God called Abraham. Do you know what God called Abraham to do? To follow me, to go to a land that I will show you, a land that I will give to your descendants. Do you know where Abraham was commanded by God to go? To the Negev. Do you know where Abraham ended up? On Mount Hebron. Do you know what he did there? When he arrived at the highest point, he built an altar and worshiped God. 
Did you know it was on Mount Hebron? Abraham bought, few, bought grave spots from the Hittites. On Mount Hebron, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their wives, all of Jacob's children except Joseph were buried there. Those 12 spies were walking in the path of their forefathers. They were following in the footsteps of Abraham, who was called to go survey that land for the purpose that that generation would go in. And they still, standing on the family cemetery, they go back and say, we can't do it. No, it's too big. Can you believe that? We see the spies sent out. We see their report. Look at number three. The reaction of the people. For those of you that think this is a simple, nah, I'm just not going to follow God today. <laughs> or, yeah, I know what God's saying to my heart, but I'm just not going to do it, and I'm going to be okay. Let me show you something that happens in chapter 14 when Israel hears the bad report and believes it. Chapter 14, verse 1, what happens? They weep. All night, moaning, crying, weeping. Why are they sad? They feel like it's a dead end. God, you brought us out of Egypt, we've gone through the desert, and now we've been waiting for 40 days to hear that we can go into the promised land, and now we hear that they are bigger than we are. They're weeping, they're, they're sad, they're sorrowful, they're broken, because they believe the bad report of the ten. But they don't stop there. No, no, notice how quickly this thing devolves into a very bad situation. It goes from weeping and crying to grumbling now against Moses. Moses, what were you thinking? Moses, Aaron, are, did you, what's the deal, guys? You're supposed to be leaders, and now you lead us to this dead end? What's the deal, Moses? What's the deal, Aaron? They're grumbling against God's chosen men. Well, they don't stop there. No, it gets even worse. They're not just going to grumble against Moses and Aaron. Now they're going to take it up with God. Oh, man. You ever want evidence that God is long-suffering and patient? God's people who more than anybody else on the face of the planet had seen God's faithfulness are saying, let's go back to Egypt. Let's find us a leader that will lead us back. They cry. They grumble against Moses. They rebel and want to defect from God. Friends, this is not just saying no to God's best. This is the first step in what can be a very dangerous downward trajectory in your spiritual life. Fourth, verse 10, they want to take up stones to kill Caleb and Joshua, that's how angry they are. God steps in and saves their lives. They're picking up stones. They're getting ready to drill these guys. And all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord shines and rocks drop. Wow. Friends, this is not something new. This story, ripped from the pages of the Old Testament, could very easily be said probably of many of our situations right here in our heart. Let's be honest for a minute. God's people today, when we are confronted with something we are supposed to do, let's talk about maybe a sin in our life that God has brought to our awareness that we know, man, maybe it is lust, maybe it is greed, maybe it is envy. Maybe it is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. Maybe it's a specific sin in our heart that we are wrestling with and God has brought it to our attention and we are reluctant to lay it down. We are reluctant to walk away from it. 
And maybe this morning we're saying, God, I, I, I believe you've got some good planned. Maybe you know right where you are that God has a specific call or purpose or plan for your life. Maybe He is calling you out from where you sit for the purpose of missions. Maybe He's calling you out from where you sit to start a Bible study in your lunchroom at, at your work. Maybe He's calling you right where you sit to build a relationship and invest and pour in and mentor to some young people. And you know that. And you're reluctant. Here's the deal. For most of us, it's not that we don't believe that God's plan for us are good. For most of us, we believe that God's plans for us are good. It's just that it's not our idea of good. That's the problem. It's not our idea of good. Wednesday night, we got to hear testimonies in the room, and there was one lady that said, I was so reluctant to become a Christian because I knew when I became a Christian, God was going to call me to be a missionary in Indonesia. She became a Christian. God didn't call her to be a missionary to Indonesia. But we have that. God, I believe your plan's good. It's just not my version of good. It's not the good that I would want. Shame on us. Shame on me. Forever thinking that the good that God has for me is not good enough. Shame on me for thinking that any good that I could perceive or conceive in my mind would be gooder than the good that God has. Man, I know gooder is not a word. <laughs> in those moments, I think we're truly afraid that it's going to cost us something that we don't want to give up. Friends, let me tell you something. There was no middle ground. There were those who trusted God and those who didn't. There were those who said, let's get up and charge it because God's with us. And there were those who said, there's no way it's going to happen. Only two options. Those that are charging hell with a water pistol and those that are laying back saying, I don't know. Joshua says in chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, if the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Church, I pray, I pray that in 2023, God calls us to things that are beyond our ability. I really do. And I hope you'll join me in this prayer. That God would call us to things that would scare the tar out of us if we didn't have faith. I really do. I hope God calls this church in the days and the weeks and the months ahead of us. I pray that He calls us to something that can only be done if God's in it. Because I want to get on the other side of that and look back and say, God, that was awesome. I want to look back on it. It's been said that pessimism has done more to hinder the kingdom of God than atheism. I don't know that I disagree with that. What was the consequence of their unbelief? Well, we saw what happened. It was this downward spiral. They started to weep, and then they grumbled against Moses, and then they grumbled against God, and then they wanted to kill. Went all the way down to murder, or attempted murder. But what were the consequences? Here it is. This is the big consequence right here. They missed God's best. Were you wanting something flashy? That's all I got. They missed God's best. Isn't it incredible? You and I can trust Jesus for our salvation. Now think about that for a minute. As a born-again believer, I trust in a God that I have never seen who sent His Son 2,000 years before I was born to a place I've never been, to die on a cross that I've never seen, to save my soul that I can't find, to take me to a place I can't locate for a measure of time I can't measure. All of that I believe completely. And yet I'm afraid to trust Him with what I can see. 
I can trust Him to hold my salvation in His hands to prepare a house for me in heaven. I can trust that. I can sing about it. I can praise God for it. But I can't trust Him to defeat my enemies down here. I can trust Him with the invisible and the eternal, but I can't trust Him with the visible and the temporal? No. It should not be like that, should it? If I can trust Him with the invisible and the eternal, I should most definitely be able to trust Him with the temporal and the seen, right? Yes. So we choose every day, every moment. This isn't one where you come down forward, you get a certificate, we send you back home. It says, I trusted that Christ was going to be the Lord of my life, and I was going to have my faith in Him. No, this is not that. This is a decision we make multiple times a day. God, I'm going to lean my entire being on you. I'm going to trust what your word says. You said you would do it, and I'm going to believe it. God, you told me what, how to live, and I'm going to lean my entire body on living like that. I'm going to listen to your Spirit's leading, and I'm going to follow when He says go. I'm going to go without any reservation because I would rather be the two with you than the ten against. Consequence was this, that all 20 years and older died in the wilderness. They would not see the promised land. They would have 40 years to wander in the wilderness only with memories of the clusters of grapes. They tried to right their wrong when God told them that they would not enter the promised land. They went without Moses and without the Ark of the Covenant and were defeated, embarrassed, because they were trying to go in their own strength. Church, let me end with this. You guys have heard me reference C.T. Studd before. I don't make any apologies. I love the guy. Was a missionary to China. Then went to India, was told that he was too old and in too poor health to go to the Congo. But he decided God was the one who would judge that, and God opened a door and he went to the Congo where he ultimately died. His final words on the soil of the Congo were hallelujah. Here's a quote from C.T. Studd in the early 1900s speaking about the work of the Congo. June, at the mouth of the Congo, there awaited a thousand prospectors, traders, merchants, and gold seekers, waiting to rush into these regions as soon as the government opened the door to them. For rumor declared that there is an abundance of gold. If such men hear so loudly the call of gold and obey it, can it be that the ears of Christ's soldiers? are deaf to the call of God. Are gamblers for gold so many, and gamblers for God so few? The same man said, God wants not nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible. Church, will you and I, right now, lean our entire weight on God? Would we be willing to say in our heart, God, I, I, Paul, I'm sorry, God, I repent. If I have kept back and held reservations on obedience to you. Maybe the most powerful thing you could say this morning is this. God, I'm sorry for making my good better than your good. Could you and I take God at his word today and live a life without reservation? If you've never trusted Christ, I want to invite you to come this response time, if you've got a decision to make, salvation, baptism, first step of obedience in the life of a believer, rededication, maybe it's a rededication of your life. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's just a time you want to spend praying with other brothers and sisters. I want to invite you to come as we'll have counselors standing here. Father, this morning, thank you for this reminder that echoes in our ears and has echoed through the corridors of time for thousands of years. That simple call to trust God. Trust His Word. Trust His plans. Lean not on your own understanding. Father, help us today to be a people that are willing to take You at Your Word. 
to do what you've called us to do, to start that thing you've called us to start, to stop that thing you've commanded us to stop. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. this morning church his goodness his faithfulness
loves you so, so, so much. God bless you as you do. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.